Slide that together. There we go. We are recording and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon and welcome back. Welcome back to 2023. <laughs> um, uh, exciting. Oh, I, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I remember the excitement of going back to the classroom and it was it's always a good time of year. Um, thanks for joining us today. We are the Google for Education team. Uh, just before we get into the formalities, I will move the slide to the next slide. Uh, and just acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and judging by all the people in the room, uh, people probably coming from everywhere today. So uh, wherever it is for you, whatever um, original lands you're on, we'd like to honour the presence of those ancestors who reside in the imagination of those lands and whose spirituality flows through the creation. Um, and there's some lovely artworks there that were made, um, commissioned by Google, by Nungala Creative and some of the many countries um, around this thing we call Australia. Um, moving over to the other side of the ditch to our friends over there in New Zealand, I'll invite Steve just to uh, welcome those folks. Nice one. Kia ora, kia ora whanau. Uh, nā mei nui, kia koutou katoa, uh, kia papatua anuku. Tēnā koe, ki te whare tēnā koe, ki te tūpuna tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa. So um, what I said there was, um, welcome everyone. Um, to the earth you pay respects, to the house that you are in, we pay respects, and to your ancestors who were before you, we also pay respects. So, today, Mario, and uh, welcome in today. Thanks, Chris. Good on you. Thanks, Steve. All right. Um, well, welcome everyone again. Now, this is we are the Google for Education team, and you can see we've got a few of us here. Uh, Chris Hart is here, Kimberly's here, Steve's here, I and I, Chris Betcher, are here. Um, and we're going to be uh, just taking you through some ideas today that might get you thinking about some things as you start the school year. We'll show you some new stuff that might have been new since the last time you looked uh, and just get, hopefully give you some food for thought as you kick off the school year. I am going to hand over to, uh, well, actually, Kimberly, would you like me to do this bit or would you like to do this bit? Oh, I'm happy for in, you two if you are, since you're continuing. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we were just going to say that we're excited to have everyone back for a new year. I know that um, uh, friends in the ACT are back in schools this week and others are starting to do bits and pieces and it is such a fun and challenging time. Uh, so we're grateful that you have made the time to join us um, this week, wherever you are. Um, Chris has put together a really great sort of selection of things to help kickstart the year. Um, everything like this webinar will be recorded um, and made available um, afterwards. So if you are unable to attend live, please feel free to access the recording. And um, we would strongly encourage you to share uh, any of these resources with your colleagues back in um, your schools or your community that might benefit from watching them as well. And we are also um, going to, and I might put the link in the chat, I'll stop talking in just a second, I'll put the link in the chat to um, the series of webinars that we'll have throughout the year. And um, we're going to encourage everyone to register for them today so that you can continue the learning um, beyond this time together now. But in terms of this week, um, we have the session now and um, we're going to hand over to Chris Hart in a second. He's going to talk a little bit out about the future of education uh, from a, a bit of research that was recently done by Google and some stuff that Chris has been working on. Um, and then uh, going to look at what's new and uh, some other cool product uh, enhancements that we're seeing and some resources to set you up for the year. And then Chris, you betcha, if you guys could, one of you could change your names, it would actually really help me. Um, so Chris Betcher, if um, uh, you're going to do some 15 tips in 15 minutes, and you've been doing a bit of a series of this already, do you want to tell everybody what to expect from those four sessions? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that, that's what you see on screen there is uh, just our little plan for our back to school um, events. Uh, as we kick off this year, and you're in the first one, this is the back to school one happening right now today. Uh, but over the next uh, couple of days, so tomorrow, uh, starting in the morning at 8.30, we're going to do a very short little sneaky 15 Chrome tips in 15 minutes, um, rapid fire. And then tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, we're going to follow it up with 15 drive tips in 15 minutes as well. And then we'll skip the 26 because uh, those of you who are in Australia um, will have a public holiday. So we thought we'd let you have that one. Um, we'll join you back on the 27th. Uh, in the morning again, 8.30, we'll do 15 classroom tips. And then in the afternoon at 3.30, we'll do 15 docs tips. Try and keep them really short and sharp um, and give you a lot of uh, bang for your buck there. Um, following that, on February 3rd, 10th and 17th, um, we've scheduled in some what we call office hours. 
So if after today and the, um, the following sessions, if you've still got questions, if there's still things you'd like to ask, you can welcome to drop into one of those office hours sessions and just chat with members of our team. You can ask whatever you want. We'll try and give you honest answers and um, uh, we'll try and just help you out if you need, need be. So that's what we have planned. Can I just say on that, with the 15 tips and 15 minutes, nobody is expecting everybody to remember, retain and implement those 15 tips in the 15 minutes. So it's kind of like, think about it as like, speed sharing like so it's speed dating but we're not trying to like we're not running a romantic um <laughs> service here i don't think uh so very much like more of a speed sharing um and if you have not had the joy of um watching chris betcher get very very excited about um little tips and tricks within tools um you should tune into one of those sessions just to watch uh, how overly excited he will get um about the 15 tips in 15 minutes and the speed at which he will talk Hot tip for you, if you don't do this already, my number one number one thing I would tell you to do for the school year ahead actually is if you can't attend something live, then totally change the playback speed when you watch it back here. I watch everything. Don't this is recorded, I shouldn't say this. Yeah, just being recorded, I was gonna say shh. No, I was gonna say I don't I definitely do not watch all of our internal meetings back at 1.5 speed because that would be totally not the right thing to do. So I would never do that. But you can actually obviously speed up and slow down um, all of the videos. And so if you are someone who is a little bit like you don't enjoy the rapid fire of that 15 minutes, 15 tips, um, maybe the best option is to actually watch it back and slow it down. So and hear me speak like this. No, he won't because you'll be speaking at this rate and when they slow you down, you'll actually be talking at a sound, like a speed that people can understand. Well, I've, I've tried to make it even easier. So for each of those four sessions, I've actually produced a slides deck and in the slides deck is 15 short videos and each video has the tip and I've tried to keep it to roughly a minute each. So uh, if you miss it, you can go and watch those back. All right, um, on that note, let's carry on. I would like to introduce to you our good friend, Chris Hart. Chris, um, for those that may not know him, Chris is a bit of a um, expert in a whole lot of things, um, but particularly, uh, I, I don't know, Chris, if you like being called a thought leader, but I'm gonna call you one. Um, <laughs> Chris does a lot of work around the world with education departments uh, to talk about not so much the nuts and bolts of how things work, but why things should work. and and, uh, and and the purpose behind the things we do in education. So I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk about some research that we've done recently at Google that he is way across. Uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you, and, and really great to, to see everyone uh, here this afternoon. And um, I hope you had a wonderful, peaceful, ref refreshing holiday, and you're ready to go for um, the 2023 school year. Um, I just want to share, and I'll, I'll just share for a few minutes around putting context across the whole series of these events that um, the Australian New Zealand education team are running, which as you've seen already run from 15 tips in 15 minutes through to more deep dive webinars and office hours, which I really, really do recommend you take up that opportunity if you've got a burning question and you wanna reach out to one of the team um, uh, to get some support on that, please do. But what I wanna do is to just take us um, Firstly, to the to the purpose of education, and this might seem like a really weird place um, to start, but one thing you'll notice about the Google for Education team in Australia and New Zealand is um, the vast majority of us are former teachers. We've been in the classrooms, we've led schools, and Kimberley's led systems, and we've been part of um, this education uh, world uh, for many, many years. And I think that sometimes um, we can get lost in the the nitty gritty of um, tools and technology and products, which by the way, we're all educationalists, but we're all nerds as well and love that. Um, and sometimes it's good just to draw ourselves back down to really think about the purpose of education. So this statement is one that we adapted as a team from the OECD 2030 framework, just to help us as Google for Education to really focus in on, on the purpose of the work that all of the people we try to support do. And so thinking about that idea of how do we help learners to develop knowledge, like knowledge is really, really important. And we want kids to know lots of stuff, but also we want them to develop mindsets, different ways of thinking, thinking like an author, thinking like a mathematician, um, thinking like um, a researcher. We want them to develop skills and they might, might be some, you know, very specific skills in digital um, skilling, but also more broadly things like complex competencies around 
um, creative thinking and critical thinking and collaboration. And obviously our Google tools are all built on collaboration. So there's a, a really great opportunity for us to make sure that we help kids see and develop those skills. And finally, the tool set. And that actually for us is obviously a key part of our work is trying to develop and to share and to provide tools for learners and teachers um, and, and indeed systems, um, the tools that they can use to really effectively to thrive in a transforming world. And I put transforming world there as a kind of nice way of saying a very challenging, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous um, world. But we want to help young. We want to help young people, and we want to help um, uh, lots of young people who work in schools to be able to thrive in this world and to really co-construct a flourishing, diverse, and equitable society. And when we hold that up, there is our kind of guiding north star, our Polaris around uh, what we aim to do. The things that we then do start to make sense. And I'm sure within your schools and within your organisations, you have similar kind of statements around um, what you do and why you do it. Um, so, Chris, if you don't mind just flicking to the next slide, please. So when we think about that idea of human thriving, um, six of the areas that we really um, think deeply about at Google, and we know that you are thinking a lot about these things as well, um, is equity and access. So how do we ensure that um, everyone has what they need? So just to, to clarify the difference between equity and equality is equality means that everyone gets the same thing but equity means that everyone gets what they need. So we're really passionate and there'll be, during uh, the rest of the webinars, there'll be frequent references to how, for example, we um, uh, the tools that we have, whether they be Chromebooks or, or things built into workspace, really support accessibility in terms of equity. But also access, so one of the things that we're really keen on, and I'm, I'm lucky to work across the whole region, so I get to work in um, uh, countries which are maybe less digitally mature than Australia and New Zealand, uh, and maybe just starting out um, on their kind of digital transformation journey where the access to technology is very, very low. So looking at how we can support them uh, to, to, to really have a high ratio of uh, devices and students. Um, but then having said that, we know that in Australia, um, access and equity, and in New Zealand, indeed, access and equity are really, really challenging. Um, problems that we're trying to get our, our, our mind around as well. We're also then thinking about anywhere learning and that idea of how do you learn from anywhere? Does it matter if you have kids who are in school all of the time? Um, what I think we learned during the pandemic is the importance of being physically together, but also how we can augment and enhance that by bringing in a digital layer to, to that learning as well. So really understanding what hybrid learning looks like, really understanding what it looks like to have a blended learning classroom. Um, during the, the pandemic here, um, I'm in, based in Melbourne, during the pandemic, you know, we were locked down for a long time and uh, I was in this room working, my wife was in the kitchen trying to teach French, my, my son, my eldest son was studying uh, for his IB exams and then my uh, two-year-old at that time was running around causing chaos and we know that we can do learning from anywhere but how do we do it really, really well and we'll be exploring things like Google Classroom as the learning hub um, which can be used both for a physical and a hybrid presence. And then agency and learning growth, we're passionate about that. We're passionate about how we can support kids to drive their own learning. We're passionate about how we can support educators to drive their own learning. So things like, which we'll, we'll have a quick look at uh, shortly, the, the, the teacher center, the applied digital skills curriculum, we have a bunch of products and programs that we can support with there. Health and well-being uh, is a real key issue. We know that by 2025, will be about 4,000 teachers short in Australia alone. Um, that's a really terrifying statistic. Uh, and when we think about the impact of, um, on health and well-being, one of a part of our mission is um, not only supporting young people through programs like Be Internet Awesome, but also supporting educators to, to get the time back that they need because one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest challenges is the huge uh, level of admin, sometimes administrivia, um, and the huge level of time demands um, on our educators. So things that we can do to help you be more efficient and more effective. Um, we'll explore some of those throughout this, this series of webinars. Sustainability, which is always on our lips and sometimes you know, gets used as a bit of a, a, a kind of um, a, a weasel word. And we talk about sustainability as um, something we should all be doing, but we take it really seriously. How do we um, support through the way that we even build our Chromebook devices um, to make them as sustainable as possible? How do we do things like um, using a program called Chrome OS Flex, which I'm sure we'll be able to share with you throughout these webinars, 
which will take old PCs or old Macs, which maybe are four or five years old and running slow because that's what happens to them, and then flexing them into new Chrome devices that you can then uh, manage as part of your fleet and reduce that um, e um, e waste as well. But more importantly, and linked very closely to health and well-being, is not just the um, environmental sustainability, but also the st sustainability of our workforce and our teaching practice. And then um, data privacy and security. We know that privacy and security is um, key to everything that we do online, um, especially. I mean, it's it's for everyone, but especially when we're working with young people. Um, and we have the we have world class privacy and world class security within the Google for Education um, products. But the thing that I'm really interested in is how we use data, and we will look a little bit later on in this webinar series at assessments and maybe understanding um, how data works. And we're doing some really exciting work, and Kimberly's doing some fascinating work looking at data to try and understand whether um, the technology itself is impacting on teaching and learning in a positive way. So there's some really interesting work that we're looking at um, aggregating data and analyzing it to get some insights into the impact of technology. And in terms of the innovation that we're working with, we're, we're all working in cloud. AI, and I'm sure you know, you've, you've, you've had lots of AI news articles in your feed over the last few weeks and the impact of that on education. I'll come to that in, in just a second. Um, but also learning ecosystems, like how do we bring all of this together? And because, and if we just skip to the next slide, please, Chris, um, we do have um, some three new reports which have come out. So um, the team worked with a, a, a global research team called Canvasate, 24 countries um, and 96 experts, I think it was. Um, they're really looking into what do these people think the future of education holds and what does Google, what's Google's perspective on that as well? Um, so they're available and we can pop that link in the chat as well. There's a beautiful QR code there for you. But basically it falls into these three buckets of preparing for a new future, evolving how we teach and learn, and reimagining learning ecosystems. So I'm just going to give you the headline um, themes on the next. We'll just skip straight to the next slide, please, Chris. The headline themes and the headline trends that come out of this research, please also read the research because it's actually very, very good and share it um, widely within your communities. Um, but the part one, preparing for a new future, really looks at the rising demand for global problem solvers. And in education, we've talked about this for donkey's years. We've talked about this for so long that we need to help kids to develop the skills they need for the future. And um, workforce, and indeed, um, I think, um, the kind of reality of working in a hybrid fashion or the reality of working in a complex world means that those skills, those generic and complex competencies, are really, really important. So um, there's some really interesting research and um, uh, insights into that. Changing the skill sets required for work, um, and then shifting to a lifelong learning mindset. Now, none of that to you will seem like this is crazy. I've never ever thought of that. But I'm sure that sits very much within your understanding of the learning journey for young people all the way um, through the rest of their lifelong and life-wide learning journey. Um, but what this research does is put some really interesting examples from around the world uh, in there. In part two, we look at um, evolving how we teach and learn, so making learning personal, reimagining learning design, and elevating the teacher. So really understanding the role of the teacher, which I think is a is a, a, a really interesting piece of work and a provocation for us. But the one that um, is on everyone's lips at the moment is how we use artificial intelligence to personalize learning, how we use adaptive technology to personalize learning. And we already have it in a bunch of the Google for Education um, workspace tools. It's already there in classroom, in um, practice sets, but within sheets, within slides, within uh, docs, you'll see elements of AI to support personalization of learning. Um, there are obviously big um, ructions on around generative AI, which is one specific type of AI, and the fact that you can get a generative AI to write an essay, and the kid could copy and paste that and, and hand in that essay. Um, what that makes me think about, and this is my personal opinion versus a, a kind of Google opinion, what that makes me think about is the inevitability of AI and the impact on, on um, uh, for example, plagiarism um, really makes us think about, well, if an AI can write an essay like that, maybe we have to find more creative ways to assess students. Maybe we need to find different proxies and different ways to personalize learning for students and assessment for students. So there's a real power within technology is to help us to do that as well. So rather than trying to, to, to outsmart AI through plagiarism detection and things like that, maybe we use it as a tool. 
And this is very divisive, and this is my personal opinion, but it's a, a really interesting place for us to start um, some more discussions. And this um, paper has some really interesting insights. And finally, up upgrading learning environments, empowering educators with data, and reevaluating uh, student progress, what it means for students to learn and how we can actually track their growth. And that obviously links very closely into how we make learning and assessment personal as well. So there's some really wonderful um, stuff in there to get your teeth into. Uh, one way I always used to do this kind of thing at school was to have a bit of a study group to share the paper and, and then four weeks later to come back together and discuss it um, over the year. So I think if you want to use this as a, as a shared resource in your schools, please do. It's available on that website, which we'll drop the link into the chat. So finally, just for the last one minute, I want to share um, really a, a kind of a little overview. And there's a little bit of animation in this batch, so we'll just kind of un unveil it slowly, is when we're talking about Google for Education, often we think about Gmail and Calendar and Drive and Meet and Docs and um, Sheets and Slides and Sites and Forms and Keep and all that kind of stuff. We think about um, that productivity suite, which is, which is really, really important and a really key part of what we're doing. But we do have a lot more. And a lot of it is freely available, which I just want to um, make sure you, you kind of know that and understand. Now, as we, you can just roll out the rest now, I think, Chris. As we um, start to kind of roll out all of the different pieces that are within our ecosystem, we've got stuff like Google Classroom, which I'm sure a lot of you know. There's going to be some really, really exciting developments within YouTube learning um, coming to, um, and Australia is actually going to be one of the first countries um, it comes to. I'm not sure about NZ, Steve, but YouTube. Um, but YouTube learning is there's some really fascinating developments happening there. Um, things like obviously Google Arts and Culture, and I've got Android there because um, if you've got an Android phone and you've never used the Google Arts and Culture app, it will literally you'll get lost in it forever. It takes the world's cultural artifacts and kind of makes them accessible in incredible fidelity. So the ability to zoom right into a, um, a painting that you would never be able to get that close to, or the ability to explore um, in three dimensions an art gallery, or to hang a piece of artwork on your wall using augmented reality. So there's some really wonderful, fascinating things there. I've got up um, Google Cloud and um, the data analytics package that we use because we're now working with a lot of, um, at a system level, with a lot of systems to look at how we can analyze data and find insights. I think Google Assistant, as irritating as it is, that every time I say that keyword, like my phone will go off and my assistant will go off. And as irritating as that is, when we think about accessibility, there's a real kind of interesting space in being able to give um, uh, kids and people access to information in different ways, Google Assistant being one of them. But then thinking about you know Google Maps and all the information we've got on there and how you transform that along with Google Earth into amazing learning experiences for kids. I know Chris is going to, and Steve are going to explore that in a future webinar. Um, Read Along, which is the free AI-driven literacy app, which was built in India. Um, we've got 80 million stories read on this app. And what it does is it uses AI to listen to the kids reading along. Um, there is a, it's in English. It's available in Spanish. Um, it's also available in a number of um, Indian languages as well. And those languages will continue to grow. Um, it uses AI to listen to a kid read and to give them immediate feedback. So you know if you're a primary teacher or if you're, I used to be a languages teacher, we would do um, running recording of, uh, of listening to kids reading. That's hard work and it takes up a lot of time. Read Along does some of that work for us, which is a really interesting application of the technology to create a little bit more time. And in terms of development of, of Read Along, um, the kind of thinking about how we then get the insights and the analytics and the data from that um, through Google Workspace is a really exciting um, kind of future step for Readlong. You may know that we've got the Google Applied Digital Skills and the Google CS First curriculum and the Be Internet Awesome curriculum. There is some amazing stuff in there. And it's not just around um, internet safety and um, computer science. I've seen some amazing applications of these um, products within, again, these free products within um, project-based learning, for example. So a wonderful example up in Korea just recently of people using Google CS first and combining it with um, art and creating algorithmic art. The Teacher Center, if there's anything that you want to know about functionally using Google um, Workspace, particularly in Chromebooks for um, education, the Teacher Center is a hub of knowledge. Google Earth, I'm sure you've used. Um, Chromebooks, if you haven't used a Chromebook yet or you haven't used um, a Chrome OS Flex device and you, uh, you have an old laptop hanging around, 
Steve dropped the link in how to flex the um, device yourself uh, and have a go at using Chrome as the operating system, which is um, for us, you know, a phenomenal, safe, flexible um, platform and device. I've got Google Translate on there just before I finish with Grow with Google, but I've got Google Translate on there. Many of you have used Google Translate, I'm sure. You may have used it on your phone when you're on holiday. And now that we can travel a little bit, you can uh, you know, use the um, Google Lens to live translate text using your camera. Like It helped me an awful lot in Korea a couple of weeks ago. Um, but also what, what's coming through Google Meet is not just um, uh, captioning, live captioning, which I'm sure you've seen. And in fact, if you want to turn it on now, you could in the, in the Meet settings, um, but also live caption translation. Now, that for me is a really exciting, interesting space. It's almost like Star Trek, like the universal translator, where you can watch someone speak in Japanese, and that will live translate into English um, as captions for you in a Google Meet. So when we talk about accessibility and reaching out and connecting out to the whole world, this brings an incredible um, opportunity to us. And the last thing, and this isn't specifically for kids, but I thought it was very interesting and really um, worth thinking about in education is under Grow with Google, we've got a number of programs, but we have one called the Google Career Certifications. And in Australia, they, they launched at the end of last year. And they're really for people who are in Korea. But when I think about some of the young kids I used to teach, I used to teach in a specialist maths and science school. When I think about some of those kids in year 10, 11, and 12, they could have done these courses and would have gotten an awful lot out of it. So things like IT support, data analytics, UX design, project management. Now these there is a there is a cost to this um, to these courses to do them on Coursera, but you do get a, cert, a certificate, which is having a Google certificate. And in Australia uh, and similarly in New Zealand, um, we've worked with companies. So in Australia, people like um, Woolworths and the insurance network of companies to say that they will accept a Google certification as a really valid um, employment kind of indicator. So it doesn't matter what your ATAR score was or maybe what diploma you've done or whatever it might be, like we will accept this certification as a, 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 as a kind of um, positive part of your CV, equally weighted in some cases to some diplomas. So that really opens up a, a really interesting piece and a, a question for us around assessment and what we want kids to do and how we help them to develop those skills. Um, so I just want to really leave you with this idea that um, this whole series of webinars is going to be super practical. Um, Chris and Steve and Kimberly are some of the best trainers you would ever want to uh, work with, and they will give you some brilliant insights into pedagogy, assessment, impact on agency, all of those pieces. But I just wanted that, us to remember that within that context of the purpose of the work that we do, that there are so many other things as well for us to explore within that Google ecosystem. And we would love you to experiment with them and see where they fit into your curriculum and really um, kind of give us that feedback on, on how this works for you. So with that, I will love you and leave you because I have to jump off right now. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar and I'll see you at some points during the rest of um, this year. Have a wonderful year uh, and take care. Awesome, thanks Chris, thanks for that overview. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, you think about Google, you think, oh yeah, Google Docs, Google Drive. And then you start to look at all the other stuff in the ecosystem, it's, it's actually quite expensive. Um, we are going to jump into some other little things now, just to talk about some of the things you might like to think about as you return to school. Um, and one of them, we did talk about this last year when we did our back to school, but it's, it's, it's kind of a good reminder to do every year, and that's just this thing called a security checkup. Um, there's, a, there's a code there for it, there's a URL if you'd like to pop over, but it's just a page where you can just go and check on your account to make sure your password hasn't been violated, to make sure you're not logged into some strange device you're unaware of. Um, it's a really good idea to do this every so often. Um, I'd like to remind you at least once a year, just you know, go and check that out. Um, just check on your latest security status. Uh, it's an important thing to do. Uh, did you know, some of you know this, but this is relatively new. Um, last year, we managed to get all of the foundation fonts for all the Australian states available in uh, Google Workspace. Uh, I don't know, teachers, Many teachers have been asking for this for many years. You know, why can't I use New South Wales Foundation font when I'm using a Google Doc? Well, now you can. Uh, and the way you do it, when you go to the fonts menu there in Google uh, Docs or any of the other tools, um, and you click on the More Fonts option, uh, if you just search for the word EDU, you'll find all of the fonts for all of the states. Uh, some states call it beginner, some call it foundation. Um, but you'll be able to add that then to your Google Docs and have that 
So uh, if you didn't know about that, hopefully now you do, um, and spread the word, because it is something that many teachers have asked about for a long time. Um, and speaking of being able to use things like that, let's jump across the ditch here, and Steve, you might just like to talk about this one, um, the ability for uh, New Zealand users to use Macrons in their writing. Yeah, nice, thanks. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Chris. I just realised my, my both my boys must have been logging on to uh, their, their, uh, their gaming device at the moment because my internet went whoops and uh, we did a bit of a slowdown. So hopefully I'm back. So yeah, look, there's, there's been a lot of questions around um, the use of macrons, um, especially important for Te Reo Māori in New Zealand, but for multiple other um, languages as well that use all sorts of accents on, um, on their languages. So there's a couple of different ways to achieve this. Um, the first one is by using a uh, little shot we've got up here by enabling what's called a Chrome flag. Now a Chrome flag is something that lives deep deep inside the settings and you find it by going Chrome colon slash slash flags and it brings up all these new settings. They're basically the experimental settings that are coming soon. So if you like to have a little tinker around with how Chrome OS works, jump into the flags and have a little look. Now the one you're looking for in here is to enable something called diacritics. So what it will do is it'll switch on the ability for you to do um, accents over certain letters. Now when you do that, if you long hold down the O for instance, it'll pop up a little menu with a whole lot of different accents across the O or the A or the E, whatever you want to do. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it um, is by going into your um, Google account and choosing different input tools. Uh, do you want me just to do a little, little show and tell of where to find that, Chris? Sure, Steve, let me just stop sharing that screen and you can jump in and share yours. All right, mate, cheers, we'll do. I know we've got a lot of New Zealand um, viewers and listeners, uh, so that's why I mentioned how it applies to uh, Te Reo Māori, but um, in any language that uses diacritics, so, you know, French, Portuguese, uh, I don't know, um, German, umlauts and whatnot, um, any of those other languages, these um, diacritics will work. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, as you can see on my, on my screen here, I've got, got my docs up and I've got a little, what's called a virtual keyboard down the bottom. And when I'm on my docs, all my slides, all my sheets, I can click on this little, and I have a little thing here called input tools. If I drop that down, it gives me some different choices I can use. Now, for Taramari, it uses um, accents over the vowels to make them a long sound. So if you ever see an O or an E with a, a little um, macro across the top, it's a long sound. So if, for this, if I type the tilde and the A, it's going to put a little accent across the top of that A for me. So that's how we can use uh, the input tools to do certain things with uh, specific letters. Um, so that's how we, that's what it looks like. So you get a little um, a little macro across the top there. Now how you do it is you go up to your little Google account picture there and click on it. I'm then going to go manage my account. Now Chris said before about the security checkup, and this is where you find the security checkup. So you go over here and you click security, and it will tell you some stuff about your Please security. On the tab. And here it is. There we go. That's it. Um, so you go, you go into your tab here. You click up into your little name there, and this pops down. The security is here. I can scroll down, and it's telling me I've actually got one suggestion to review. Now, if any of your passwords have been compromised, they'll list here and actually tell you which one was compromised. So you can go and have a look at that. But anyway, let's go to personal info. If I click on personal info, and then I scroll down. You'll see down here, there are some general preferences. So I can choose input tools here. If I click on that, it's going to say, what do you want? If I want to have the Dvorak keyboard, if anybody knows what a Dvorak keyboard is, it's kind of split in half and apparently it's set out the better way. I don't know. I had some students in class who wanted to use it just because they knew what it was. So I can click on that and I can then choose a Dvorak keyboard. There's a whole lot of other things down here as well. So to find those input tools, into your account, click on your face up there, jump into your personal info, 
and then you can go into those input tools. Then when you've got them, they do live up the top here in the three dots on the keyboard. They do live up here on the three dots in the keyboard. See, it's been since December since we did a webinar on this, Chris. I'm really rusty. I never do these things. I'm such a lie. So there's two, two little ways to get accents or macrons into your typing. Other different um, languages, you can do Esperanto, you can do Portuguese, whatever you want. There is also a drawing keyboard as well. So if I wanted to write A with a macron on top, it will then give me a whole lot of choices on the bottom, and it will then insert that as well. So special characters into there using the writing keyboard. If you have a touchscreen Chromebook, go for it with your, with your stylus there. So that's uh, macrons and accents in uh, doc slide sheets. Um, the, the flags will allow you to put it across a whole lot of other things as well inside chat and email and all that sort of stuff. Awesome. Thanks for that, Steve. I'm just... No um, I I'm will just stop. Sure. Stoppy, stop, stop. Okay. We go. I'll just head back over here. So, yeah, just so a um, couple of other things I want to remind you about. Um, some of you have heard of the teacher certifications. If you haven't, I'm about to tell you about them. We have teacher certifications that can... Uh, basically qualify or certify your knowledge with using uh, a whole lot of Google tools in the classroom. Um, we have an entry level one called level one. Uh, we have a slightly more advanced one called level two. And then we have some other certifications as well that if you have level one and level two, you could apply for some of the other uh, higher certifications, one of them being what we call certified trainer. But um, let me just tell you the level one course, um, we, we've had a lot of, um, schools and systems around the world now sort of say to us, you know, if all of our teachers were talking the same language, if they all had a certain competency level uh, where, you know, we knew they knew what they were doing in terms of using the technology in the classroom, um, it would it would change things. And we've had a few schools now where they've actually asked all of their teachers to try and get level one certified. I can think of at least three or four schools here in Australia that have, that have done that recently. Um, and the anecdotal evidence that I'm hearing from those schools is it, it's very much changed the landscape of the, the way technology gets used in the school because now teachers have a baseline of understanding. Um, they start talking the same language. They start sharing ideas about what's possible without feeling confused by them. Um, and so the idea of getting people to that level one certification seems to be a really valid thing. Um, we've also had some conversations with universities, uh, a couple of universities here in Sydney that I've done some work with. Uh, that are now talking about certifying their pre-service teachers. In fact, a couple of universities approached me and said, you know, we've got teachers coming back from their pracs and saying, wow, I went into a school for my prac and I had no idea Google was used as much as it is. And I felt a little bit out of my depth. So we've done some work with a couple of universities here and also in New Zealand as well um, to, uh, to run some courses for pre-service teachers and actually get them level one certified. So when they go out into the workforce, they've got that baseline understanding of how to use these tools in the classroom. Chris, uh, um, a really nice thing as well as I'm in New Zealand, when you really register as a teacher, you've got to show evidence of professional learning. And yep. a lot of schools, teachers will do this. There's my certificate. There's my evidence of professional learning. I'm upskilling all the time. It's a really nice one to use. Yeah, awesome. So um, if you've heard us talk about level one or level two before, um, that is uh, definitely something you might think about doing. Uh, and, you know, why not make 2023 your year to get Google certified if you're not already? So just we'll do. think about. Uh, think, talking about developing skills, you heard Chris Hart earlier talk about the Applied Digital Skills course. Um, and there are a number of different things in there. If you've not seen the Digital Skills course, it is a whole bunch of lessons and lesson ideas that you can use with your, with your kids in the classroom. You can do them yourself, you can use them with your students, um, but they are prepackaged lessons with little video tutorials to step you through. And they're project-based, so they might be things like, you know, create a, um, you know, create a graphic or design a brainstorming chart or come up with a, um, you know, a, a spreadsheet that calculates X, Y, and Z. I can't think of examples off the top of my head, but there are a ton in there and uh, they, they're all, classified into all sorts of categorizations. You'll find all of them at applieddigitalskills.withgoogle.com. And once you get there, you can sort of browse around and, and see. So if you're looking for lesson ideas, um, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to find them. So yeah, think about that one. Chris also mentioned before a thing called Read Along. And again, if you haven't tried this, it, what it is is a virtual 
assistant that uses AI and it helps young children learn to read. As uh, Mr. Hart said before, it, it operates in multiple languages. It was originally built in India and it was designed to help uh, Indian children who were not attending school to uh, have their basic literacy needs met. Um, and since then it's expanded into other languages, including English and I think um, Spanish and yep. French, I think. Um, yeah, but, it's really great for people who are elementary level users of Spanish as well. So you can read kids' books in, in Spanish. Ah, so uh, Gillian says she's actually using it with her K2. So that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, but it's got a large collection of stories in the in the app. Now there's an app and there's an so and it's Android only at this stage. I believe we think about doing it for iOS, but at the moment it's Android only. Um, and it's also available on the web now at readalong.google.com. And you can use it on either. I think you do actually get a little bit more functionality with the Android app, but only because you don't have to log in. So if you want to use it in a completely anonymous state without having kids log into anything, you can do that in the Android app. Um, but Kimberly uh, has two young children, and uh, Kimberly, I believe you've been having a bit of a play with this with your own kids. I have one of them just joined me on video because we've got thunderstorms and lightning happening in Melbourne right now, and um, that's terrifying apparently um but yeah actually i have my kids playing this today um so i'm doing some expert um parenting during school holidays um but it's really interesting so i have um a, a daughter going into grade one and so she's reading already um and uh so she likes the actual reading part but my son who's going into four-year-old preschool he can't he only reads a few words but there's a whole lot of games actually in there around phonemes and things as well so it's like you know identify which letters make the ah sound and they get to pop up balloons and things and uh, the thing that i like about it particularly my four-year-old is that um she tries you set a daily target of how much reading you want the kids to do and um the ai assistant does a really good job of trying to incentivize and motivate the kids you know you're doing such a great job just a couple more minutes and you'll hit your daily target and um and yeah you watch the kids go oh okay what other things should i do to continue to um, read and I, I've talked about it before that you know every anybody who's a junior school teacher and has done running records or other ways of tracking student reading over time or had your own young kids like I'm experiencing right now there's only so many times you can patiently like encourage a child to pronounce certain phonemes in certain ways whereas the AI never gets frustrated she never runs out of patience it's quite phenomenal to, you know, they can say the, the same thing, um, you know, slightly incorrectly, she'll correct them, say, try it this way. And she never ever gets like frustrated like I do when I'm doing readers some, sometimes mm -hmm. in the evenings. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, I definitely really strongly encourage you to check it out if you haven't as well. Um, Gillian, I think it could be used with older kids. I, I can't remember what level it technically goes up to, um, but I also noticed today in the app, there's also now um, the ability to create teacher groups within it. So you can actually have some um, admin insight into um, like delegating certain things to um, your students as well, which is really great. I, I don't know how new that is. That was the first time I've seen it. I'm hoping it wasn't some early release feature that only I have and that I've just now said on a recorded webinar. But um, if it was, let's just scrap. Can you just edit that out after, Chris? That would be great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Kimberly. Um, I did. I was in a meeting with the Read Along team recently, and there are some big plans for this tool as well. So wherever it is right now, you can rest assured that it is definitely on a trajectory to having more, uh, more and better. Um, Gillian, you mentioned you mentioned uh, that you've used it with your kids. This is absolutely no pressure to do so, but if you wanted to unmute and give us a quick description of what you've done with it, um, I'm sure everyone would love to hear it. But absolutely no pressure. You're muted. Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, I actually was very excited about it. I'm a teacher librarian and I promoted it to all the K-2 teachers and the leaders took it on and they're just loving it. So it, it's really something like you say, instead of running records and the kids love it. They really do. So it's very encouraging, um, you know, as uh, Kimberly said, it really um, um, tries to make them read and it gives them lots of feedback 
and they get things, you know, stars and little books and all sorts of things. So, yeah, at our school, it has really worked. So um, I, I was hoping that we could use it also with the older children because I think they'd like it too. That's so, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That was that was you prompted it unscripted, but that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank um, you. Let's just uh, carry on here. Just a couple of other things before we uh, move into just some what's new stuff, uh, and then we'll finish up for the day. Um, there was a blog post. Uh, Google has a blog called the Keyword, and on the Keyword you'll find all of our announcements and you know, all sorts of interesting articles that we publish. Um, one that caught my eye recently was um, a list of 22 helpful tips. So I actually went through 2022 and rounded up the 22 most helpful tips from last year and put them in a single blog post. So um, when I read it, there's some really interesting things in there on productivity. There's some cool tricks and getting creative and some some self-care tips and stuff. So if you're interested, the, uh, the QR code is there, but it's also there, blog.google, inside Google, most helpful tips 2022. Um, which you're welcome to go and jump over to. Now, when I had a look at this this afternoon, just have a look at the tips, one that jumped out to me was this one here, tip number 22, surprisingly, and it was a breathing exercise. If you just go into Google and type in breathing exercise, you actually get this. Now, if you've, if you've used Fitbit or Apple Watch or anything like that before, you've probably done these breathing exercises where you get the little circle that expands and contracts to sort of slow down your breathing. Um, and that's basically what this is. But what caught my eye was at the bottom of the breathing exercise, there's a little arrow. When I clicked on it, it unpacked, and there's a whole bunch of other tools in there that I didn't know existed. So there's a coin flip, there's a guitar tuner, there's a metronome, there's a dice, there's a there's all sorts of things in there that I had no idea were there until this afternoon when I was uh, playing around with it. So if you'd like to try it, uh, I wonder if I can do it here. Let me see if I can just switch tabs. Let's share this tab instead. So if I go in here and type in, I'm going to do it the way I found it, breathing exercise, right? And it brings up, this is the breathing exercise thing that uh, was one of the 22 tips. And if you click on that, there's a little circle. So whew, out with the bad air, in with the good air and so on. Like there's the breathing exercise. But this thing down the bottom here, if you expand it out, it's got all these other things, including like there's a spinner. So if you want to do like a selection of things in a classroom where you, I don't know, assign numbers to a student and then spin the dice and or spin the spinner and like number four is the winner. Uh, but there's other things like, uh, you know, a guitar tuner. Ah, oh, hang on, press the microphone. Ah, <laughs> it will actually pick a, pick a note and tell you how close to that note you are. Like clearly I'm all over the place. But anyway, just, I, I had no idea these existed, so I just wanted to point them out to you. So all of the fun things that we learn preparing to do these webinars for you guys uh, that hopefully you get something from. Uh, all right, so that there, then you go. Now, the other thing I just want to mention, um, we last year we ran a series of webinars called Learn with Google. Um, we are going to continue them into 2023. Uh, there you can see the... Oh, sorry, Chris, hey. you need to switch tabs oh, again. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, I did. You sing to nothing because we couldn't see what you were singing to. So that would like make the sing that. that made the singing part like extra um enjoyable. So. Yeah, right. Totally embarrassed now. Um you couldn't see what I was gonna tell to change tabs like you told me, gosh darn it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so we are doing these webinars again next year. They are every month. They're the third Thursday of every month, uh, just like they were were last year. They will be recorded, we will be posting them online. We encourage you to join live if you can, but if you can't, that's okay. Now, uh, we put up the the, um, the link there. Uh, we, we've still got a little bit of stuff to cover over the next 10 minutes or so, but if you would like to jump into that link and register for those webinars, um, I think Kimberly and I were talking about perhaps doing a little draw at the end for a couple of t-shirts, you know, just random draw for anyone who registers during the course of, uh, of the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. So um, hopefully there's some interesting topics there you can see that we're gonna try and cover during the year. We will bring that up again for you later in the uh, in this webinar. Uh, but just for now, we're just gonna talk about some of the stuff that's new um, that you might like to know about. We'll go through this pretty quick. Uh, there is a new default setting for shared drives. So Steve, you mentioned this one. Do you wanna just real quickly just um, tell us? Yeah, sure. Um the thing that we found with shared drives in the past is that people don't even know what's in them or that they even have them. Um, and so with a lot of our um, storage cleanups we've been doing, 
we've now brought in a default size for shared drives. Now you can change that. If say you've got one that you you, you share with all your, your community has a whole stuff in it, you can change it. But some defaults have been brought in. Now this is one of those things that gets emailed out to the admin of the school and often the admin of the school is not an admin, it's a, a generic email address. So this is something that we would flag. Um, if you do happen to use shared drives a lot and you find you can't save to one, it could be because it's over its default size. So just something to flag there, maybe that passes on to your admin at your school. If you are the admin at the school and didn't see this email, check which email address it goes to. All right, cool. Uh, next one, there's a timeline view on Google Sheets. This has been around for a couple of months now, but you know, a couple of months in the big scheme of things, people might still not know about it. Um, so it's a timeline view. If you create a Google Sheet and you've got a column that says like something like start date and another column that says end date, then you can, from the insert menu, you can convert that sheet into a timeline view. Just say insert timeline and it'll just automatically create a timeline view for you. Uh, you can color code it and change the way it labels the bars and whatnot. But if you're creating timelines or Gantt charts or anything at all where you're trying to look at how something looks over time, this is a great new view inside Google Sheets uh, that's super easy to use as long as you have the data that it has a start date and an end date, it'll automatically make it for you. It's great for year plans or unit plans as well. You can see how they kind of all overlap because obviously yeah. you put a whole of people together and get a whole of departments playing together. Yeah, yeah, scope and sequence, diagrams, that kind of thing. Awesome for that. Um, you can now present slides directly in Google Meet. So it used to be that if you were present, if you were in a Google Meet and you had slides, you had to sort of have two windows open. Now if you're presenting in Google Meet, you actually have a little... Um, next and previous button so you can actually you don't have to go back to the actual slide deck you can do it from within the meet itself which is super handy uh the there is also uh, and again this probably doesn't affect everybody but if you are someone who does administer a google domain and you are responsible for you know setting up that back-end service for workspace um, there is now a certification for that so again for those who who do it, uh, it's always good. I, I believe it's always good to certify yourself in any skills you've got. It, I think makes you more, um, uh, I think makes you more knowledgeable, more productive, because it's thorough, but it also probably makes you more saleable as well, if I can use that term. If you ever did want to move to another job or apply for something else, having that certification next to your name, I, I, I don't see as anything but a good thing. Um, and so there is now a certification for the Chrome OS uh, administrator certification as well. Um, and we'll give you these slides. We'll, send, we'll, we'll make sure you get a copy of these slides so you have all these links. Um, there's some expanded language support in Google Meet now. Uh, you've probably heard us talk before that Google Meet, now this is a plus feature only, so if you're using the plus edition or the teaching learning upgrade, um, you have this. Um, but there are many schools now throughout Australia and New Zealand who are running on plus, so we figure it's uh, worth knowing about. Um, you can do translated calls on Meet. So if you're in a Meet call, I can be speaking English, you can be speaking, I don't know, Portuguese or something, and we can converse back and forth between the two languages and it will actually do the translations for us. Um, originally, we launched this with, I think it was English, Portuguese, Spanish, French, German, from memory. And we've just now introduced also Japanese, uh, Chinese, Mandarin, and Swedish as well. And I believe there's some other languages coming down the pipeline right now. So continue to expand the language base for this um, translation in Meet. Uh, there's also some neat things coming to Google Docs, some of which I can tell you about and some of which I can't, but I'm very excited about. Uh, but one of the things that's coming, yeah, you've heard, as may have talked in the past about smart chips. So inside a Google Doc now, you can insert a thing called a smart chip. And it would be like, uh, for example, if I typed the if I just typed the words Kimberly Hall in a document, it would just be two pieces of text that said Kimberly Hall. That's it. But if I type an at symbol, and beginning type Kimberly's name, it will insert a little chip in there that I can hover over and it's going to give me all sorts of information about when her next meeting is and what her email address is and what I can when I can call her and those kinds of pieces of information. Smart chips are really smart. And one of the new ones we've just added is a code block. So if you're teaching coding to students, uh, doing anything at all code related, so you might be doing some STEM work or they might be teaching computer science, um, you can now paste code blocks into Google Docs 
and it will uh, observe all of the usual standards for indentation and color coding, and it'll actually make them sort of workable code blocks. Not workable, they, they won't run, but like they will look like um, properly written code blocks inside Google Docs with this new feature. Um, as I said, there are some other smart chips coming that I will hopefully be able to tell you about next time we meet, but um, there is some really exciting stuff coming to Docs. Well, I think so. And um, again, if you're using Gmail as your mail uh, service, uh, there is a button down the bottom of Gmail now. It's that one in the, in the GIF there with the two little envelopes. And when you do that, you can turn on what we call multi-send mode in Gmail. So normally, if you were to send an email to multiple people, uh, you'd get one email that went to multiple people. Uh, with this multi-send mode, you can send an email to multiple people, but it will actually, the, the email will go a different copy to every single person. So instead of one email to 10 people, you get 10 emails each to one person. With, along with that, you now have the ability to insert tags like their first name and their last name. So if you were to type hi and then an at symbol, you could pop up their first name and their last name. And then when you send those emails, you get the 10 emails that went out, but they would each be individually addressed to the correct person using their first name based on the, um, uh, the, the record you've got in your contacts. So that's a really neat feature, and I believe we're probably in the future expanding that out to just more than first and last names and email addresses. There'll be a whole lot bunch of other things you can insert in there as well. So that is a nice change for doing customized things in Gmail. Chris, I'm just conscious that there is uh, three minutes remaining and I'm conscious that everybody has a lot on their plates. All the right. So All is there like maybe one final feature that's worth a call out or something uh, and then maybe we can cover the rest of them in the next month's webinar? Yeah, look, the problem, the, that one there transcribes speech during Google Meet calls into a Google Doc. Uh, that, if you look in the in the uh, Meet call we're in currently up at the moment, you see the red recording button up in the top corner and next to it you see a blue button. Uh, that's telling me I'm running transcription. What that means is at the end of this call, as well as getting the video recording, I'll also get a Google Doc with the text of everything that was said during this call. If I'm trying to go back and find something that was said, it's a lot easier to do it from a Google Doc than it is to try and scrub through an hour of video. So um, transcription is now available in Google Meet as well. All right, um, just to circle back to the webinars, hopefully uh, maybe some of you might have even went off and registered for the Learn with Google webinars. That's our monthly webinar that's, that we do every month. That's what makes them monthly. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna give people another moment or so if you'd like to do that registration, there's the link again. And then, um, I am going to, we won't do it during the call because like Kimberly said, everyone's busy, but I'm going to go through the list of everyone who um, uh, registered and I'm going to pick mm, three names at random and I will get in touch with you for a contact address and we will send you out a prize. So thank you for registering if you did. Much appreciated. Um, and then just to finish up, Okay, well, that's what, we, that's what we've just done. Don't forget, we've got our 15 tips in 15 minutes coming up uh, tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, and then on Friday morning, Friday afternoon, uh, the Chrome tips, Drive tips, Classroom tips, and Docs tips. And then if we still haven't answered your questions or you'd just like to drop in for a chat, honestly, um, come in for the office hours on the 3rd, 10th, or 17th of February. We'd be more than pleased to, uh, to, to catch up and just, just have a chat with you. Uh, and that brings us to the end. Um, and we're carrying this across too. If you if you want a certificate for being here, if you if you use PD certificates for tracking your attendance at things, um, if you go over there, bit.ly slash GFE certificate, capital G, capital E, um, you can fill in that form and it will automatically generate a uh, certificate for you for attending this afternoon. It is an honor system, so you've been here for one hour. <laughs> Uh, and on that note, uh, I think that brings us to the end. Yeah, yes, it does. So uh, on behalf of the team, I would like to say thanks for uh, joining us this afternoon. I'd like to say good luck for an awesome 2023. Uh, hope it's awesome. It's, uh, Steve or Kimberly or anyone else on the, anything you want to add? No, I totally, totally agree. I'm gearing for a great year. Uh, we're all hoping it's going to be nice and settled this year. So um, this is like heading back into the classroom. And um Come and see us each month, and we'll hopefully keep you entertained and, and updated with some cool stuff. And um, nice work, Chris. Thank you very much for uh, emceeing the madness that has been this afternoon. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now, uh, and uh, like so.